much. I'll pass it on to. Okay, great. All right. Well, I guess uh, maybe uh, Jeannie, do, do, do you want to uh, maybe update us on what the other crazy stuff is going on right now after the Hmm. Well, let's see. Um, what we're most concerned about right now is a bill that's just been uh, reintroduced in the state of Tennessee. This is a bill that started last year. It uh, passed the House and it's now, uh, and then it was withdrawn. Um, it's kind of a long story about how that happened, an inter interesting one, but it got with Drawn. And we were hoping that it would stay away. Unfortunately, it, uh, like a zombie, has come back from the dead, and the um, uh, sponsor of the bill reintroduced it last week. Unfortunately, it um, was voted out of committee, and I think, if I remember correctly, it's now gone to the full Senate, and they're expect expected to have a vote on it sometime this coming week. Now, this is a bill that, um, if it passed, it would be very detrimental because it's one of these Academic Freedom Act bills. It, it's a bill that bundles together evolution and global warming as controversial issues. Now, the, the concern is that th this, is, this is backdoor creationism. This is an effort to smuggle creationism in by calling it the evidence against evolution, or for calling for critical analysis of evolution, or teaching the strengths and weaknesses of evolution and global warming. And of course, these are, uh, these are right from the creationist playbook, because for years they've been saying that evidence against evolution is evidence for creationism. So in their view, when teachers are teaching uh, that evolution is crappy theory and uh, students really don't need to study it or accept it or take it seriously, what they're, what, what they're saying is because God specially created things. And, and that, of course, is the logical conclusion or illogical conclusion that many students will come to because they, they only know, uh, they only uh, think that there are two possible alternatives. So if you, if you um, uh, deprecate evolution, therefore you are supporting creationism. And that's the way the creationists think. So that's why they want to get these kinds of bills passed. If the Tennessee bill passed, uh, passes the Senate in a week or so, um, then it'll have to go back to the House because there are slight differences in the bill. But it's, the differences are so small that they're not worth worrying about. And it's pretty clear that... Um, uh, if the bill passes the Senate, it will become law, and then it will become a model for other states, and that's going to be very unfortunate. If uh, you're interested in this, take a look at our website, because it's been front page news for the last week or so, and there's several articles about it. And the website is National Science Education. It's ncse.com. Okay. Great. Uh, guys, if any of you have any questions, uh, you know, you can come up here so we can see you. Um, Especially hear you. Hear you. <laughs> I have many, but I don't want to dominate because that's my favorite subject. So okay. everybody else go ahead of me. I have a sister in Tennessee now who is a teacher, and I will be contacting her to make sure she gets in touch with her representatives in Tennessee. Did you hear it? No. Nope. <laughs> go ahead. I actually had a sister who recently moved to the Memphis, Tennessee area who is also a teacher, and I will contact her tonight to get in touch with her representatives and spread the word over there as well. Excellent, yes, please. Sort of nonsense. Absolutely. It, it's got to be, it, this is a political thing. Uh, send your sister to our website because we've got some, you know, good information on, on the um, law and why it's bad. And the fact is that um, the geology teachers associations uh, Nobel laureates and also AIBS, the American Institute of Biological Sciences, uh, as well as science faculty in Tennessee of um, trying to remember which universities. But there has been a very good turnout of teachers and scientists uh, who are, are opposing this law. And when your teacher, when your sister contacts her representative, this might be useful information for her to use. Okay, we have uh, Gilbert here, and Gilbert, uh, 
goes to creationist meetings here in Kansas City. Um, and I actually was kicked out of one. They, they Only one? Yeah, they threatened me with filling a trespass next time, so I'm not going. All right, here's your question. Yeah, I go all the time. It's kind of like sadistic uh, behavior of myself. But, uh, you know, I, actually, I go to these meetings all the time, and, uh, and the whole purpose is to just kind of figure out where they're coming up with their logic and how they are uh, oh, going about things. what they're doing. And I realize the scale of what they're doing is quite large, Do you, and I'm very concerned about it because they make these DVDs and so on and distribute them. Okay, here we go. Gilbert is uh, still going to masochistically continue with the creation. Of <laughs> I don't know where we got cut off at. I, I, think, I think you were asking, you were talking about how widespread their efforts seem to be with their DVDs and their books and their programs and so forth. And I think you were, you were starting to ask me, is this something we should be concerned about? Yes, I was just wondering if you were aware of to... Uh, is anybody taking these one by one going through these and maybe there ought to be rebuttals put on YouTube and that sort of thing? The, um, the creationist material tends to be very rep uh, repetitious. There's very little that's new that's come out. They seem to be uh, hammering the same old arguments and just rearranging them in various ways. It's the uh, you know gaps in the fossil record and the second law of thermodynamics and uh, the design argument and all of its various um, uh, uh, efflorescences. Um, butterflies are a big deal with them. There's a couple new ones, um, videos out that feature butterf butterflies, and it's basically the old argument from design. You know, how do you explain metamorphosis without God having created uh, and designed this kind of thing? Um, it, it, nobody has got time to, to take a look at every single one of these and rebut them individually. But what has been done, what is available, and actually there's quite a bit on YouTube too, are rebuttals of the various arguments that the creationists use. I would um, uh, suggest you go to the website talkorigins.org. If you're not familiar with that one, that's um, a great reference or resource for anybody. Talk Origins, all one word, dot org. It's a compendium of, of refutations of the alleged science of creation science. Uh, online at talkorigins.org is a um, compendium of creationist arguments, I think is the actual title. It's written by a guy named Mark Isaac, I-S-A-A-K. And Isaac's compendium, by the way, uh, 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 Isaac is a, is a veteran of our Grand Canyon trip. <laughs> that's, that's on the side. Um, Isaac's compendium is a wonderful bestiary of all of the creation, almost all of the creationist arguments. Uh, it is online and you can also get it in hard copy. It's also very nice sometimes just for, for people like us just to reach up and grab a book and, and look something up. It's published by the University of California Press. So that would be the first place that I would start. Uh, for uh, intelligent design refutations, which overlap, of course, with the creationist, uh, the, the traditional young earth creationist that you're talking about. Uh, Pandasthumb.org is a very good website for refuting the um, uh, ID claims. Um, there are a lot of individuals who make videos uh, refuting the creationist arguments. Um, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I know this guy. CDK, Why? There's a guy, CDK007 on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Aaron Ra. When, and Aaron Ra, right, and Thunderfoot. Thunderfoot, right. Thunderfoot spelled instead of uh, F O O T, it's F 0 0 T. Um, but if you looked up Thunderfoot creationism, you'd get just a couple dozen really good, solid refutations. So there are there are resources, and uh, yeah, you know, obviously there can always be more. Um, but there are some good people out there who are trying to help. But like I say, an awful lot of it is to be recycled because the creationists pretty much use the same arguments over and over. Okay, we have uh, Willard here. So, and by the way, how much time do you have, Jeannie? Well, um, how about um, until the top of the hour? Okay. 
Sounds good. We'll cut us off whenever. All right. Well, here's Willard. Okay. Uh, he's from Missouri, so don't hold it against him. <laughs> Originally from Iowa. <coughs> well, actually, I mean. Willard gets around. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't know, actually, if I should even bring this up, because I know this is supposed to be about science, and I support you entirely. I'm a lifelong atheist, and even was taught evolution in faith, Missouri. Um, but uh, I would question the claims of the separation of church and state in the history, because what I find in my studies is that you know, when the, I mean, yes, they did have a constitution that did not include the God and had that you know, thing that can be interpreted as separation of church and state, but the, I don't see where the society ever took the hold of that. Instead, I see the religious people and the, and the courts ruling in favor, and then uh, there was a time when atheists didn't even testify in court. There was some rich guy that tried to leave money uh, to where they didn't uh, teach religion in school, and the courts knocked that down. And that whole history that I see is that, that the, the, the separation of church and state was not recognized and it's only been a more recent thing that has come forth. And I just don't want to make a long thing out of it, but, you know, because it could be much more detailed. But yeah. I was just going to point Yeah, and, and, and mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, um, and obviously uh, what we did, where, where we're talking about that subject on the trip, you're only getting a little clip. But uh, it is a very interesting history, and the current way that the Establishment Clause is being interpreted by the uh, federal courts, the district courts, appeal courts, and the Supreme Court, um, is different from what it was, say, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I mean, the, the law evolved as, as everything else has. And uh, also, there's there are nuances of how the Establishment Clause is interpreted depending on the subject matter. But as for education issues, the courts have been quite consistent for uh, at least 50 years. Sure. That when it comes to schools, the, the public institutions really do have to be religiously neutral. Uh, you can neither promote nor um, inhibit uh, uh, religion in the school. So if uh, an atheist wants to give money to uh, support teaching anti-religion uh, in the schools, of course the courts are going to strike that down because that is not being, the schools would not be being religiously neutral if they were promoting atheism any more than they would be religiously neutral if they were promoting Christianity or any other, or Buddhism or any other religion. You've got to be religiously neutral. And the good news for uh, people on our side of the creationism issue is that the courts have been incredibly consistent about the interpretation of the First Amendment. You just can't teach creationism or you can't teach the Bible as truth. You can teach about it, you know, descriptively. Uh, you can't teach ID. Um, where I'm worried is with laws like this Tennessee law that's coming up, where they're not mentioning religion at all. They're not mentioning creationism, they're not mentioning intelligent design. They just want to teach evolution on one side and then balance it out with the teaching of, crea of um, evidence against evolution on the other side. And unless you can convince a judge that given the history of this controversy, evidence against evolution really is just code for teaching creationism, we're going to be in a bad way. Because uh, that would open the door for teachers who want to bring this stuff. In. Of course, you could always then go and sue the individual teacher if you can catch the teacher doing it, and if you have somebody in the class who's willing to be, whose parents are willing to uh, let them be plaintiffs, and those are two very big ifs. So, yeah, the, the history of the Establishment Clause has been very interesting, and as you say, it has changed over time. All right, we have another question here from uh, Adam. Well, you, you may very well remember it from the discussions we had on the trip, but uh, one of the things that is always kind of striking me as the problem in the fight is that it's a reactionary fight from our side, from the science-based side. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the challenge of, you know, what we need to deal with because we, we're coming at it from a side of, you know, here, here's the facts and here's the data and why do you keep fighting against it, try to keep getting this mythology back in. But, you know, is there anything you've ever been able to come up with since then that's more of a proactive rather than in a reactive state? Uh, 
that's kind of <laughs> not a really good phrasing of the well, question, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, of course, what I, we I do maybe is... Maybe a sugar daddy, a rich sugar daddy. Who's got a couple of yeah. <laughs> It works for me. If you find one, send him my way. Um, but you know, uh, assuming he likes evolution. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, as far as what NCSE does and is capable of doing as a really rather small nonprofit out on the West Coast, is that we leverage the um, actions of local people to fight these fights. I mean, keeping evolution in the classroom is really a political issue. It's an issue of uh, persuading decision makers to either encourage it or let it be taught, uh, or to encourage decision makers to stop the teaching of religious views masquerading as science. And that has been NCSE's focus. Now, clearly, there's a much bigger picture involved in this controversy, and that is getting teachers squared away so that they um, feel confident to teach evolution, they know they're going to be supported, and that they also know enough about evolution and know enough about the nature of science to do a good job teaching it. Many teachers don't. Uh, that's kind of outside of our job description. That's really what we need university professors to do. They, we need to have them do a much better job teaching evolution and teaching the nature of science so that the people who become t teachers in the high schools or junior highs are able to um, uh, deal with the subject and, and teach it without compromising it. Um, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in terms of raising in general public literacy. And uh, that's also unfortunately outside of our job description, although we do what we can in terms of our website and our Facebook page and, and um, uh, personal appearances of uh, staff members. But it's, this is a big society. It's a huge uh, uh, country. And, um, you know, we need a great deal more input from uh, the media, especially television, which reaches such a huge American audience. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm concerned that there's a lot more to be done. And uh, um, I, I'm looking for all the allies to get it done that I can. All right, we have uh, Tim. Tim. Tim here. Okay. I'm not real, real much up to date on this issue. I'm just kind of wondering if people still use the point of getting monster argument when, when I talk about this issue. Well, they never actually did. Uh, the flying spaghetti monster was a um, was a tongue-in-cheek joke uh, invented by a Kansan for all of that, a uh, graduate student, and it was intended to poke fun at the intelligent design guys uh, by postulating uh, a different designer from the Christian God, which of course is the designer of the intelligent design folks. And um, it's, uh, it's been a great deal of fun, and now there's bumper stickers, and there's plushies, and there's just all sorts of memorabilia for the um, uh, Flying Spaghetti Monster. But it never was uh, something that was presented seriously as an alternative to be taught in the public schools, certainly. But it's, um, it's, it's been a great deal of fun. It would be a global uh, warming. Yeah, but global warming and, and uh, the, the association between global warming and pirates is one that obviously we have to pay more attention to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have Josh here, so, all right. Hey, Jean. Um, so, you often talk about working with religious people and spiritual people to help promote uh, good science education. A common, and object our <laughs> uh, a common objection to the theory of evolution is that it means there was no Adam, therefore there's no original sin, and therefore there's no need for Jesus, and the whole house of cards collapses. When somebody comes with, to you with that, what do you say in response to that? To somebody who has that particular version of Christianity in mind, um, there's not a heck of a lot that I, as a non-believer, am going to be able to say, uh, because, you know, I, I'm not speaking that person's language. That person needs to talk to a fellow evangelical who, uh, who sort of comes from that same faith tradition, but who wants to accept evolution because there certainly are evangelicals who accept evolution, and we need to have them 
talk to as many folks like the kind you're postulating as possible. Uh, I usually recommend that uh, if somebody comes up to me with that, you know, all of Christianity collapses if evolution is true kind of argument, I send them to an organization called the American Scientific Affiliation. And its website is ASA3, that's a numeral three, ASA3.com. And uh, uh, on the ASA website, they will find discussions of you know, creation and evolution. And they will find that most of the people there are theistic evolutionists, but they are evangelicals, which is something that conservative Christians find hard to believe. Uh, so they can explain why, in fact, Christianity does not collapse just because of evolution in a way and with much more authority with that audience than I ever could. Um, anybody else? Larry, do you have a question? Okay, uh, Gilbert has another question for you. Well, not, they've asked all the good questions, there's only a few left. You know, the organizations that you see that support uh, answering these questions, you know, I'll just give you an example. I was watching your film, and... Um, well, I, actually, it's Greta's film, I, you know. Okay. I was just along for the ride. <laughs> she has to take the credit for it. <laughs> okay. In the, what I see is a lack of uh, people being able to answer in simple terms, uh, the same generic terms that these creation scientists use. They use these little simple phrases to come up with these ideas, and, and they have to be met with simple ideas to come back, because otherwise nobody understands them. The long list of scientific data that we have just obliterates it. It's not useful in a situation like that. And uh, in the first part, we're talking about the uh, nautiloids that were in the lower layer of the Grand Canyon. This is a big deal to the creation scientists. They say there was a current pushed these things all in one direction. And here's an example of what I would recommend. In a situation like that, I would have said, well, of course, all, the current, I agree with the idea that they go in the same direction, but supposedly they were all killed by hot water and uh, very quickly. And yeah, the response I would have given was, uh, you notice there's no soft tissue here. Also, all the living chambers are missing, and uh, which means these things have been rolling around in the bottom of the ocean for some time, and naturally they line up the current. Uh, and also, there's no other creatures there with them that were in the same area. None of the food that they eat, none of the, none of the other hard shell uh, nautiloids that are, in, let's say, in, in circular shape. There's a whole list of things that could have been said. And what I see is a lack of, um, with the professors I deal with here in Kansas and so on, they, they, they're just not familiar with the argument. Even though they know all the answers, they just haven't had time to think about it and put them together in simple terms to address this. And I think this is a lack of something we need in uh, this battle, is simple explanations for simple ideas that just obliterate these ideas that they're having. You, you, do you, have you had this sort of discussion in the past or anything like that? The, um, the refutation of creationist arguments uh, obviously has to be done in language that the public understands. But in many cases, you, you, you don't have the option of something quick and snappy and a soundbite. If you're talking about the second law of thermodynamics, that doesn't lend itself very well to, to well, actually, that one probably lends itself better to <laughs> snappy phrase. I picked a bad example here. Um, if you're refuting polonium halos, say, uh, that's not something that you can just uh, dispense with very swiftly with a, a couple of quick quips. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, and I understand the importance of, of necessary simplification. But I also think that you shouldn't be too overly concerned with the scientific refutations. It all depends on who you're talking to, I should say. Um, well, what we've always done at NCSC is divide the population up into three groups. You know, one group are the people who fully accept evolution, like us, and that's fine. They're, you know, we don't have to, we can educate them and help them understand uh, the subject, but we obviously aren't trying to convince them. At the other end of the continuum, there are 
uh, conservative Christians who really, for religious reasons, find it very, very difficult to accept evolution because their belief is that if evolution is true, uh, like uh, the man behind the camera was saying, if evolution is true, then they lose big. Uh, all Christianity has to crumble, and that's something that's very important to them. In the middle are people, uh, you know, Americans, um, who by and large aren't conservative Christians because you know, there's such a wide variety of American Christian denominations. Uh, they're probably religious because most Americans are religious. That you know, that goes with our territory here. But they're not biblical literalists theologically. They, they, so there's really no reason for them to have to reject evolution. This is the group that we have been aiming at. I'm not really trying to convince a conservative Christian um, why the second law of thermodynamics or gaps in the fossil records or polonium halos are, are bad examples or are, are bad science and can be refuted. But I am trying to talk to that middle group of Americans who really don't know very much science and who I could, and for whom a clear and simple, as you were saying, as you were advocating, a clear and simple presentation of science would be very helpful to help them understand that yes, the science is very sound and there's no reason to reject it. But with people like that, uh, with, with the middle group, it's usually not necessary to go into the tit for tat. Uh, it's not really necessary usually to um, refute uh, you know, or to, to go into uh, why the nautiloid um, fossils don't uh, indicate the flood. What you do have to do is help them understand evolution itself. Because most Americans don't really know what the alternative is. Uh, evolution is poorly taught in school, if at all. And there's pretty clear distortions of evolution that you get from the various television programs where evolution appears. Uh, e even unfortunately, sometimes on, on good channels like uh, National Geographic and, and um, some of the other channels that show a lot of nature shows. So I would I would pick your audience and then frame your argument accordingly. Um, and if your interest is in persuading a conservative Christian to change their views, then uh, you have to first approach that individual from the standpoint of assuaging those emotional concerns before it's even worthwhile trying to introduce the science because the fingers are going to be wedged very firmly in the ears uh, until that person gives themselves permission to listen to you, so to speak, uh, until that person is convinced that, well, maybe he won't lose really big if you're right. Because as long as he's convinced that, that he loses if you're right, you're not going to win, no matter how good your data are. There, there will always be some way of, uh, of wiggling out. Anybody else has a question? Uh, Cole? No? Oh. All right. Uh, I guess we'll have Gilbert give you the last one. <laughs> I'll just make a comment. I do this all the time when we're talking about I talk to conservatives far right and, and in the middle. The middle mm -hmm. is the target. I'm trying yeah. to convince the middle as they watch this. Usually there's middle people standing around or kids, whoever. And when they see this discussion going, they realize the people they can trust so dearly and think are so reliable are not. And they realize that there's an opposite side of what they're hearing and this gives takes away credibility from the people they're relying on and gives it gives them some insight to the opposite view. It works quite well. And when I run into hardcore Christians, I just say you really have the pyramids were built when the flood happened. And right away, you know, I, I go through that little longer detail that it gets their attention and they don't even know it. That's and, and I when I point out they, what, what the scriptures say, they don't even know 99% of the time. At that moment, they realize they have a problem. They can't dispute it, really. And at that point, you have some head, and it, it slows them down in their views, and it works. I mean, I, I've done it a lot, um, and I've convinced one preacher to quit preaching completely. He left the profession, and that one I'm 90% sure of, just by doing simple things like this. Week. It's hard to do it on a friendly basis. I work very hard at it, and it takes time. But I think. Um, the people that, by taking on creation scientists, what happens there are leaders and people in a group that are not as hardcore as what everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. These people have... Absolutely. I agree. They are, they have consciences, and 
as many of them do. And when they are challenged or embarrassed, Iggy embarrassed one, the guy doesn't even talk anymore at meetings. <laughs> For real. I mean, you know, he is a, this guy's a PhD physicist. And uh, Iggy embarrassed the guy, he doesn't peep anymore. Before the all meetings he went to, he was talking all the time. He sits quietly. This it takes away their, uh, their ability to spout off or speak so boldly because suddenly they realize they can be embarrassed with just a few sentences. And uh, it has worked great. I'm not sure uh, that people look at this. I, in the Kansas City area, um, I, there's only a few of us even went to these meetings. I still go. And I'm learning a lot. I, and I think there's kind of a gap, a, a small, I think there could be something gained by um, people learning to address these things in a simple manner. And this, these are tools that teachers and everybody can use. So the biggest, you said earlier that teachers uh, don't know much about science. A lot of them don't. But they certainly do not know anything about the evolution creationist debate. And uh, this is a big area that has to be looked at real close. The preventers need to come up. I, 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 I don't know how you do what you do. You've got a big task. <laughs> you know, but if we could organize a little bit more to do more in these states that are having these battles, we're not very effective, actually. I think mm -hmm. as a group, we could possibly do a little bit more organizing. And if you guys are interested, I mean, that's something I'd look at if you ever get into that more. I'm done. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. Great question. Uh, and maybe the last question. I, I saw you had Michael Dowd there mm -hmm. uh, during mm -hmm. the trip, and actually he came to Kansas City uh, a couple of times uh, preaching uh, he, about his book, Thank God for Evolution, to a couple of I, the Unitarian churches. <laughs> is, is this the kind of allies you are talking about, or are you actually talking about somebody like Kenneth Mil Miller or Keith Miller? Uh, yeah, actually, Keith Miller from Kansas State came and talked to us, uh, what, about seven, eight months ago? Yeah. Uh, so is, are you talking about spiritual Christians? Okay. Or are you talking about... No, what, I, what I was... When, when I was talking before about American scientific affiliate members, American scientific affiliation, uh, a group of evangelicals, most of which accept devolution, um, that's Keith Miller. I mean, that, that is, in fact, Keith is an ASA member, and I think he's uh, he even presents papers and is relatively active in that, uh, that particular association. Um, people like Michael Dowd, um, Michael started, came from an evangelical tradition, but I think it would be hard to, to classify by him as evangelical. He's really so far out there theologically compared to what the uh, the evangelicals believe that it's, it's you know, he, I don't think he's going to be very effective with that group of Christians, although that's, those are the ones he'd really love to reach. Uh, and Ken Miller, of course. Oh yeah, I think, and, and I think uh, Connie's been part of that influence there too. Um, because, you know, she has some, uh, you know, fairly new age um, scientific spirituality uh, beliefs and, and, you know, they live together and talk together and, and influence one another's uh, uh, perceptions. Um, yeah, he and Connie signed up for the trip. They were a lot of fun. They um, uh, have a lot of energy and, and are uh, compatible with the other people on the boat. We, we enjoyed their company. Uh, as to the, um, the creationism and evolution controversy, uh, to the extent that he is uh, educating more people about evolution as a theological view, um, fine. You know, I mean, I don't care a whole lot about um, theological views that, that accept or reject evolution, really. I, I just want to see good science taught in the classroom, and that's a hard enough struggle. Um, but, yeah, I do think he, he's, probably, he's probably doing some good. Um, he might be doing a lot of good, and I'm just not as aware of it. But uh, his, his company was quite enjoyable on the trip. He was one of the uh, fun people to, to have along. Uh, but that tends to be the case with that trip. Uh, really good people go on it, so. <laughs> and I think I saw a couple of cans of beer there, too. <laughs> You might very well have. <laughs> In fact, there is a um, uh, a uh, sack that is towed behind the boat in about uh, the the boat is like 50, 55 degree uh, temperature. I mean, I'm sorry, the river behind the behind the boat, 
And so all the beer cans or soda cans, and if you have wine in a you know cardboard box or something, that's dragged behind the boat. So by the time we camp for the night, um, the the beer is a really good temperature. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's about a good time to wrap it up because we'll probably go out for a beer ourselves in a couple of minutes. Well, have one for me, and then happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. It's a good day for a beer. All right, great. Well, thank you, Eugenie. I appreciate it, and I guess just, uh, let's just clap it and uh, close it out. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody.